Tandem Nomads episode 193. When you say Tandem Nomads, it's a tandem. It's all about partnership. Um, so, you know, in a, in a partnership, both sides have to be interested in what the other person is doing. And I think this is really crucial for a very successful partnership. Hello, Nomad Nation. Welcome to Tandem Nomads, the podcast show and entrepreneurship platform where you can find great inspiration and tips to grow a successful portable business and thrive in your global nomadic life. This is your host, Emel Deregi. I'm your business and marketing coach and the founder of Tandem Nomads. Tandem Nomads. So all of you who are just listening to this episode for the first time, this podcast is all about how to turn um, your dreams and your wishes into a successful portable business and grow a business that is on one hand, creating real good revenue and at the same time making an impact. But the story behind Tandem Nomads is much more deeper in this episode is um, is all about the tandem and how this whole podcast show started, which is the journey of a lot of expat couples who end up moving abroad and one of them having to give up their career to be able to support the career of the working partner. And today I have a very special guest to you. This episode is probably the most special episode since my first episode ever, because if there is one thing that has helped me in my journey to grow with my business and to grow as a person, grow in my career, is the support of my dear and lovely husband without whom any of this would have been possible. So today I decided to invite my husband, Michael Friedel, to hop on this call and share with you the behind the scenes of our journey growing as a tandem and figuring this out. Michael, thank you for being here and are you ready for this ride? It's a pleasure to be here and I'm really ready for this ride. <laughs> yes. Would you please introduce yourself to all of those who don't know you? Who are who is Michael Friedo? Yeah, so I'm first of all, I'm Amel Deragi's husband. Um, and I think uh, that's very important for you to know. Um, in my professional life, um, I'm the Austrian Trade Commissioner here in New York, at the moment here in New York City. So what does that mean? I represent um, Austria's official trade and innovation promotion agency called Advantage Austria. And just like in the foreign service or in, in the di diplomatic services, we are being sent from country to country, sometimes every three years, sometimes every seven years. And I've been doing this for the past 21 years in various countries. Uh, now being uh, uh, here in New York and living uh, in New York and helping Austrian companies do business invest um, and find innovative solutions to you know problems that they might have um, just encourage business and trade and commerce between countries and that now i do it in the united states could you tell us a little bit about all the countries you've been through and what were some of the highlights for you in terms of your career what is the thing that you love most about your career well, you know, I mean, I started very early uh, being interested in traveling and spending time abroad. I did uh, something in Europe, which was called interrail journeys, um, where you get a, you know, a, a pass for, for trains and you spend a month on the train going from country to country. Um, I spent um, at, at a very early age, a month in the United Kingdom learning English. And I was always interested in, you know, traveling. I, mean, I have a travel bug from, from my dad, I think, in particular. Um, so for me, it was clear that if I wanted to do a job, if I wanted to do something professionally, it should also involve being abroad, um, you know, being able to see different cultures, live in different countries. Um, so one of the options was this job that I applied for here, being, you know, working for Advantage Austria, um, doing commercial and economic uh, promotion and, and, and support. And the good thing is, you, as I said, you will be sent from country to country, but you're not like a salesperson, you know, who's living in a plane uh, and, and going back and forth all the time uh, without a home. Um, you're really integrated and, and, and kind of find your space uh, in a particular country and live there for many years to help Austria in that particular country. So I started this journey in um, 
South Africa. Um, my first posting was South Africa. It's more than 20 years ago. Then I went to Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates, um, where I was posted for about two years. Then I came for my first time, uh, professionally for my first time to the United States, Washington DC for another three years. Uh, then I became trade commissioner, so heading an office um, before I was deputy uh, in Iran, Tehran, for five years, where we met. Mm -hmm. uh, then I went back to Vienna for two years to work a little bit in HR and uh, personnel development. And now for the past six years and a bit, um, I've been posted here in New York. So That's amazing. So I do think it's important to get to know you and your journey. So thanks for for sharing that and thank you for willing to be part of this episode. I know it's a little bit special because we try to be as private as we can, but we also want to um, share what is what our journey has been, its challenges, but also its um, our learning lessons to help other tandems who might be in our situations. But I think it's important before we go into this topic of sharing the behind the scenes of our journey as a tandem. Um, I just want to put that nomination out there. We're going to share our journey, but we are very aware that there is no perfect couple. We don't consider ourselves like everything worked out perfectly. We had our journeys, our struggles, our ups and downs, like every couple. Um, we just want to be as transparent as possible, but also share with you, you know, what has worked for us and what we would love to help other tandems like us where hopefully we can understand and that's the biggest message Michael and I had before we started recording this episode and the the reason behind tandem nomads and why even called tandem nomads tandem nomads is because I believe that this journey to be successful even if running a business is something that is an individual journey as an entrepreneur as an ex expat couple, it has to be a team deal. So we kind of wanted to share with you what has been this journey for us. What did we have to deal with uh, to grow along this journey? And hopefully we'll continue to grow. So Michael, thank you for being uh, willing so openly to be here and share that with us. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't said anything yet too openly, but I'll yeah. try. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So, um, you know, so Michael said, you said that, and maybe I should maybe explain a little bit how we met before we go into this journey. So Michael and I met, as we said, in Iran. I was living in France. I was having my Korean advertising there, and I've pretty much settled to settle. I was ready to buy my apartment, and uh, even if I was very young and early stage of my career, my dream at that point in my 20s was to settle down because I've been raised on the move. And then I went to visit my parents in Iran, and that's where the first night out and my, with my parents, I meet with Michael. So, uh, Michael, whatever, <laughs> whatever I say. Oh, it's so strange to call you Michael. I've never called you Michael. <laughs> Anyhow, so honey, yeah. I will be telling our. Don't story. tell everyone all the names you call me. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, I won't do that. <laughs> No, but anyhow, we met in Iran and then we did not date in Iran. You came to visit me in France. I'm not going to tell all the lies that you came up with to come visit me. But <laughs> once you visited me, the question of Korea came up the first day we started dating, like the first day and even marriage came up the first day. Um, and just a real quick summary in Amat Nation, we basically dated for six months, not even when we got engaged and we got married a year, a year after we started dating. So, and the Korea was part of the conversation from day one. Um, the deal when we met was that both of us will be looking for a job, right? You remember? Yeah. So could you tell your side of the story? It's more important for me that you tell us what was going through your mind when you met us, when we when we met and you realized that the career might be a problem for us to be together? What were the thought process that you've been through? In a way, it was not like, um, oh, it's the perfect um, situation for a couple. You know, this is really a match made in heaven, although I think we are. But I mean, um, in 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 structural terms it was not a match made in heaven you know you were just visiting Iran but something happened so and 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 I used my lies to go back to to France to Lille to visit you and I think it was clear from the beginning um 
that we wanted to stay together and, and give it a shot uh, as, as a proper relationship and not just a, a fun um, friendship with benefits, you know, across borders. Um, and when it comes down to that and you live in different countries and you're from different cultures and you're maybe even from different religions, et cetera, et cetera, um, you have to make a plan. You have to think about, you know, what, uh, what are you willing to give and to do to keep this relationship? Uh, you cannot just expect somebody to give up everything uh, and move uh, within months, actually, to another country, just, you know, in the spur of a moment. So it's a give and take. And I think we had this conversation and we said, you know, obviously, first of all, we have to see each other at least, I think we said once a month, you know, to, 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 which kind of worked out. We saw each other, you know, halfway in between in Vienna or we saw each other in France. We even saw each other, I think, in Iran once. So before we got married, so it, it, it you know, we, 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 we really tried to keep a physical contact as well. So make that a plan. And the second plan was also to, long, to, to, to think long-term. Like, what does it mean for us? Um, can you stay in France? Uh, if yes, then what would I do there in France? You know, would we find a job? I think we, I remember we talked even about finding a job that kind of fits my criteria, multinational business or, 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 or politics, like in Brussels, which is half an hour away from me by, by fast train. Um, and we kind of had an agreement and said, whoever finds a job first for the other one, uh, that is, you know, not just a job, but, but, but really all, a, a job that fits, um, that's what we're going to do. And um, I think I won in a way, you know, won. <laughs> you won the bet. Like this, yeah. And you did move to Iran. Um, but I think this is something you have to talk about right from the start, especially when you have a multinational, across the border, long distance relationship, you know. I mean, make a plan when you're going to meet, where you're going to meet, and also about the life that, is about to come. Don't expect your wife to just give everything up or your husband to just give everything up. Um, but of course, it's a bit of a, a balance sheet that you that you go through, you know, what jobs do we have? What opportunities do we have? Where why might we move next? Uh, what are the opportunities there? So it's a very grown up conversation that sometimes, you know, is maybe not ideal when you're just in love and 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 and, and happy and uh, excited but in the long run it makes sense for me on top of the identity aspect which i had to work through um the biggest part that i know every expat partner that gives up a career to move abroad struggles with especially when we've been independent for so long is that financial dependence and i will well there's first of all arriving in the country where you don't know anybody that, that doesn't help. But on top of it, I remember how guilty I felt, how bad how, it was so difficult for me to suddenly depend financially on you because at the beginning I did not have that revenue. You know, of course I had some savings and things like that. And it was our money. You always told me it's our money, right? But I was wondering how did you experience that on your end? How did that look like on your end? Money, of course, is kind of a, uh, a, um, a way of telling you how important you are to the organization or how valuable you are to society. But a lot of values in society and a lot of importance that is existing out there is not um, paid by money. That's people who take care of their sick parents. Um, that's people who take care of... Um, a move, you know, um, of organizing certain things, of using their time, which is also very valuable, without being paid to do certain things that an economy would not survive without. Um, and, and I think this is something where a rethinking somehow has to take place. And this is what we, I think, also thought. Whatever I'm doing, just because I get paid or maybe paid more, doesn't mean it's really more valuable to society or to the world or to us than what you're doing, you know, or what a, a wife or a husband or a partner is doing. So I think 
you know, this conversation is important to, to, I love it. Yeah. No, I love what you brought up here. The fact that, you know, as an expat partner, in other words, you have a role in the, in the, in this journey and you are contributing to that salary to come and you're a lot of expat partners are taking care of the transition of the move yes. of the management. I remember when we moved to New York, you know, you were with a delegation of 30 people and <laughs> I needed to prepare everything before they came so that, yeah. you know, and that part is not factored um, really well and represented really well. And even if you do have an extra little income when you get married, um, but it is the recognition at the end of the day. Um, but one thing I want to say and put out there, what I've been the most grateful for, Michael, is that um, when I was struggling with that money aspect, you always made me feel like it was our money. It was our money. And it took me a lot of time to consider it our money. I remember I would go shopping and feel like I'm always spending your money at the beginning. So it takes time. I think at the end of the day is that communication and reassurance that you brought into the platform, but also telling me that, you know, I had a role in that and that's in this thing. And actually we'll maybe talk later how our roles have changed over time. Recognize that. I'm, I'm going to tell you real quick something um, that you might know, know, honey, is that along this journey, we started, I did not have a job, I didn't have a career, I didn't have yet a business when we started. I mean, my business started just a couple of months after we moved to Iran. And I have to say that in order to compensate my lack of confidence and my lack of identity uh, that was shattered, I did find a lot of pride, joy, but also sense of identity in supporting you in taking that role as the spouse. And I'm just a little bit worried sometimes when we get stuck in that role. And I think that the organization never asked me, I never felt like the organization asked me to take care of this role and you never asked me. I think that there's also the society and how our upbringing, I've seen my mom always do that. Like she's also an expat partner and mm. she's always been taking care of that. So in my brain, I've always thought that I was the one who had to take care of it and I would take it very seriously when you had all these no, I would automatically take care of the move. I would automatically take care of the management of the catering and everything until at some point when my business had to grow, I was like, I need to grow my business. And I remember I, we had this conversations that I cannot take care of this anymore. And that's when we realized you have a team for catering. You have a team for people who are paid for this and we should use them. Nobody's asking me to do it. There's mm -hmm. also a societal thing, but also I realized that it was hard for me to give up on this role and be in the forefront of being the hostess in your events. Uh, I have attached a huge meaning into it and it took me a lot of time to, to detach from that and realize that I can have a role without being the hostess who cooks. I felt very guilty of stopping to cook for your dinners at some point because I felt like it made me feel like a bad wife. Uh, mm. But then I realized that I could support you in other ways. Well, I mean, first of all, um, when you stopped cooking for our guests, I think our guests <laughs> suffered because your cooking is really great. Uh, honestly, I mean, it, uh, we, we have very good Algerian. We had some very good Algerian dishes sometimes. Um, but you're right. I mean, uh, you, you maybe fell into a role that you just, first of all, through your mom, I guess, and what you observed uh, in your own family, but also what society maybe expects and, 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 and kind of... Uh, you know, especially the country we moved or you moved to first, which which again is an Islamic Republic in Iran, Iran, where maybe men have a different role from women. Um, so it well, was kind I, of... Just to cut you here, I don't think the problem is the country of Iran. The problem is the community of expats and diplomats. Let's be real. Uh, like Both, they, I think both. Yeah. I think it was both. I mean, yes, it, it's also the expats and the diplomats where, where people think like normally it's the man having the job. Mm -hmm. You still find very rarely you find a, a female ambassador, um, especially in Iran, I have to say again. But but I mean, very rarely you find a, a woman who's who's kind of the the the, ho the professional host, let's mm -hmm. say, in a way like, you know, I'm invited to the ambassador of Switzerland, who's a woman. Uh, so so in most of the roles in our, you know, job that we do, uh, I would say probably 90% are men who are doing the, the, the job, the professional job, and very often the wife, yeah, it is the wife, or sometimes it's also the uh, same-sex partner. 
um, is taking care of the kind of, you know, hosting, preparing, uh, uh, um, you know, yeah, the, 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 the hospitality aspect of the, of the whole thing. And that perpetuates a little bit that maybe role that, that, that people, you know, want to get out of uh, and that organizations expect, you know, because they say, yeah, but 90% are men, you know, so. And I think what, what, what made the difference um, after a while is, first of all, I also didn't like it when people only introduced you as the wife of, mm -hmm. you know, um, because you have a name uh, you have a role, uh, you have a career, you have a history, you have a personality, you have a political, you know, perspective, you have a lot of different, you know, ideas. So you're not just the wife of. Um, and I think it happened, you know, not too long into our marriage where people realized, you know, uh, she's not just the wife, you know, she has some interesting things to say. Um, and, and I remember dinners we had here in New York where people were sometimes surprised about your, you know, input, professional input into the conversation because they might have expected, yeah, well, that's the wife and she's allowed to join our dinner when we talk about, you know, financial industry and monetary policy and political decisions in Washington, D.C. But then they really got engaged in a discussion when they realized, well, you you know, you have something to say. Um, and, and, and I think to talk about this, to, to having, have to talk about it is, 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 is sad, you know, because you, we still come from this kind of perspective. Oh, I'm surprised if his wife is also contributing to the conversation. We should not be surprised. Um, but, but, but in the end, this is what still a lot of people might, you know, think. Yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And you're, it's funny that dinner was a big one because I think that was the one where I felt very, very guilty because I had proactively said, this time I'm not going to cook. If you, but if you want, I just don't come I, because I'm not cooking. And you said, no, you should join the dinner. I was the only spouse mm. and I was the only woman too at that mm. table. I remember. So I wondered actually, why did you ask me to join that dinner? Because, you know, I did, I did, I, I was, yeah, actually, I never wondered why did you you insisted that I joined the dinner. Well, it was first of all, it was a small group. You know, it was a it was a partly friends, but partly you know like bosses of these friends. Um, it was a business dinner, but it was also supposed to be a kind of a private invitation. I mean, half private. So of course, I mean, like, why would the wife not be allowed to join? Uh, and 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 I knew that what we would be discussing. Are also things where you have a lot of input, you know, and, and in the end, that's what they said, you know, it's not always, you don't want to just only simmer in your own soup all the time, you know, and, and, and like ping pong, uh, play back and forth the arguments that we have heard many times because we're all old Western white men, you know, and, 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 and we, we maybe think alike. Um, so I think it's, it's, it, it, it spiced up the conversation and it made it more interesting also for the guests. And I think that was important. So the contribution was not a home cooked, fantastic lamb couscous, <laughs> but it was a homemade, interesting idea contribution to a very important discussion. Interesting. So there's, we talked a lot of this transition from money to identity to the role of the expat partners. Interesting. I love having this conversation with you because we rarely had it. So it's, it's great to have it. Um, I think you know, we've had it, but in, in, in different terms, not like, yeah, in a different like way. this. And, yeah. It's, it's interesting for me to hear you bring this up and talking, basically what we're talking about here is not only diversity, but also women empowerment and, yeah. and seeing women from a different lens than the, in French, we would say la potiche, the woman who's here just to smile and be beautiful. Mm. Uh, and I think I love that you have proactively decided that we're going to bring a different narrative into this, in this, into this professional world. And I love you for that. But you know, I love you for that too, but you know the thing is, and and maybe I can come to 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 a topic here. Um, it made it it was easy for me because you were interested in what I'm doing and you were interested in the people I met. 
I mean, obviously, you were not doing a hundred percent. I mean, like you, you, you're not following every step I'm, I'm making, and you don't know all the things you know that I'm doing professionally and etc. But in the, it started right from the beginning. Actually, you were interested in what I'm doing in my job in my organization. You even had ideas how we could do our job better. You have, uh, I mean, you're extremely clever and intelligent. I mean, you have a lot of, you know, uh, input on things we are doing or the political economic discussion and you're interested. So it's not just, you know, please be here for an hour and pretend to be clever. Um, it's, it's um, you have an interest and you like to meet the people that I deal, that I, you know, work with and that I, uh, kind of service, you know, uh, through my profession, um, and you have your own ideas about that. And I think that's that's very important that you have that interest in what your spouse, husband, wife is doing. Um, that doesn't mean you have to do it every you know hour of the day, but 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 you should be interested in how your spouse is spending the day and what they are doing professionally. And what, which problems they have, and which ideas they have, and you should, you know, again, ping pong have input on both sides. Yeah, um, you know, you said something very important here. You were talking about how I was interested in your job, and I do think that that was something that has helped us a lot in becoming a tandem. And I think that's the one. Every time I meet a new expat spouse, if I when I when I when I'm being asked, okay, what is the thing that you think is very important to do? I do believe that it's important that we, first of all, put the relationship on the same level, that there's not one career more important than the other, but it's really important that we as expat partners feel very interested in what our partners are doing so that we can support them intellectually as well and understand their hurdles. You're also going through transition mm. and challenges from a posting to another. And the best way for me to support you is to know what's happening, but also vice versa. You are very much interested and involved in what I do, which will, um, and here is the big part that I want to talk about. Maybe we can now transition into that entrepreneurial journey. You've been part of this entrepreneurial journey with me from the beginning, from the start. Um, I, and you've been involved, you, you've been part of my team. I've been using you and I still use you as my proofreader sometimes to save money and I have to spend on it. <laughs> so you've been really helpful in helping me in my journey. And thank you for that. It's been just amazing. But the one thing that I'm the most grateful to you is how as soon as I started realizing that I was stagnating and I wanted to take this business to the next level, I needed a huge, to shift a huge part of my focus 100% on a business and I dropped a lot of things. Not only I dropped my role as, a, as an expat spouse, the traditional one, but also at home, you've been taking charge of a lot of things lately, of the cooking, of the shopping, of even the laundry and all of that thing. And it meant the world to me that you were so helpful, not only in the business, but and helping me build the support system I needed when I needed to push through uh, some of the aspects of the business. So, it, but on top of it, the biggest thing was the mental support that you brought to me. You've been always here. I'm not going to cry now, but um, it, it is a journey. It is a personal and transformational journey. And you've always been there to cheer me up in a tough moments and to uh, support me. But I would love to know what has been your biggest challenge to this journey yeah i mean it, it maybe it was not always hunky-dory and 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 positive but i i don't remember so much like really really hard times you know um you just have to shift i mean first of all i was i was happy that you started that entrepreneurial journey um for me i was coming into an office of course i also had to settle in you know and it wasn't always easy uh, and we had our issues at the beginning, you know, with different things. Um, but uh, I, I kind of had my job. I'd been doing my job for the, you know, 15 years before that. I kind of knew the office. I know what's expected. I knew the system. I, we had an apartment. We had, I mean, it was still a struggle sometimes, but it was kind of an, uh, a, 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 
patent landing zone in a way, you know, it was kind of a soft landing, you know, not a hard landing. And you had to start everything from scratch, you know, I mean, like you became an entrepreneur. I mean, you had certain, obviously certain talents before about, you know, marketing, about business, about entrepreneurship, but a lot of the skills that you needed, you had to just learn. Uh, you had to use a lot of time to do that. Um, and I think um, also, of, of course, insecurities, like, you know, am I failing? Um, am I a fraud if I'm, you know, um, selling something and, and, and maybe my customer is not 100% happy or, or, or doesn't become a billionaire within a week? Um, it's, 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 it, it's these questions that you probably had to ask yourselves much, yourself much more than I did. And I think I wouldn't call it a struggle, but I would call it um, an inspiration that your entrepreneurial journey has also helped me to be a bit more entrepreneurial because the questions you ask yourself and the doubts you had and the struggles you had. And I remember, you know, I sometimes, you know, you, you were nearly breaking down, you know, when you talked about certain things that I had to, I had to oscillate, let's say, between the role of trying to be the supportive husband plus the maybe critical customer or, or you know, observer who says, yeah, but maybe that's really shit what you're doing, you know, <laughs> sorry to say that, um, plus the, the, the kind of motivator and mentor to say, but, you know, this is normal in a business like that. And, and when you are a first year, second year entrepreneur. And so that kind of struggle, maybe I had to pick my role sometimes, but it actually helped me as well to become a bit more entrepreneurial and to ask certain questions about my own business. And we don't call ourselves so much a business. We're more like an official organization that helps. Uh, we're not government, but we're kind of, you know, a bit like government. And, and to have this entrepreneurial spirit, this can-do attitude, this willingness to learn and changing things, um, change things, that was very helpful, actually. So I think it was an, a, a learning trip for both of us with ups and downs. But I, I, I don't remember like really, uh, again, it's about listening. It's about, you know, trying to understand. And it's also not always about trying to find a solution. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't have the answer. Sometimes you don't have to say, but do it this way. Or why don't you try this? Sometimes it's just, yeah, listen. I understand. And I listen. And, 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 and I think your journey became my journey a little bit. You know, I mean, um, I, when, when you feel down uh, in a way, I also kind of feel down because I realize you don't feel down easily. You know, I mean, you're, you're, you're a positive person. You are very, uh, uh, you know, you, you put a lot of effort in what you're doing. You put a lot of energy in what you're doing and you want great outcomes. And I really appreciate that. But sometimes it just doesn't work out, you know, and sometimes there are things that don't work, you know, and, and you just have to accept it, you know, yeah. sometimes and learn from it. So it's, it's a good, it's a good trip. It's an up and down trip. It's sometimes rocky, but in the end, it's, I think it was positive for both of us. Thank you for sharing that, honey. It, it means a lot. And, um, you know, you said something really important here, and that's about having the support system, being interested into each other's journey, growing together. So many great insights here. Nomad Nation, I hope you are, I hope that it helps you in your journey where you can identify probably with a lot of things that we are discussing here. Um, but one thing you said, and I remember that was our first month, I think I moved in, I moved in September and I started thinking about this journey in March is the like our the first month of March after we got married I really broke down that was the first breakdown I had I had many breakdowns but the first one was in March and I remember crying and telling you I don't know how this is going to happen and and um you came home and I was just a mess and and you were like okay what do we do now should I so I quit my job and we just go back home. And I was like, what's back home? I don't have a back home <laughs> because I had lost everything for me, you know, but, uh, but I remember telling you, you were really trying hard to find a solution. And I think you're really good at remembering certain things and applying them. I remember telling you, you know, I don't need you to find a solution. I just want you to listen and understand my point of view. 
mm-hmm. the solution, I'll figure it out, or I'll ask you to help me to figure it out. But for now, I just need to cry and I just mm-hmm. need to. <laughs> And you did an amazing job at sometimes just listening and not saying anything. Yeah. And that's a typical man, woman thing, I think, you know, just listen, don't give me a solution. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and honestly, I mean, first of all, I think and this is also for all the tandem nomads out there. Um, you, you have to be aware of what your partner is doing and giving up. You know, I mean, sometimes it might feel like, yeah, but, you know, She's just moving to another country with me. She lives in a nice house. You know, I mean, I have a great job. We have enough money. She can take care of the kids and, you know, and uh, everything should be fine and everybody should be happy. But you don't know what, you know, the life plans and life expectations and, and, and career expectations are of your partner, you know. And sometimes maybe they don't talk openly about it. So be aware of what your partner, both sides, you know, is is doing and maybe giving up and 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 be a bit not just respectful but aware just of that and 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 don't take everything for granted you know don't don't say yeah you know okay tomorrow we're moving to dubai it's great anyway the weather is better there it's nice in winter and you know we're gonna have a great time it's not that easy so 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 be aware of that and 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 a lot of people especially you when you moved to iran you gave up basically everything So it's important to know that. And the second thing is, as you said, sometimes it's not so important to just find a solution or or solve a problem immediately. But again, be aware of the problem. Don't feel attacked, you know, because somebody has a problem Mm. with the the situation you're in. It doesn't mean that this person hates you Mm -hmm. uh, or, or makes you responsible or says it's because it's your fault that I'm in this situation now. In the end, yes, of course. I mean, if you hadn't met me, you didn't, you wouldn't have had to move to Iran, and and a lot of other things. But but you know, don't feel personally attacked. Listen, maybe find a solution. Sometimes you don't find a solution, but that's I think very important in every couple. And that's not just you know tandem nomads, people who go from place to place. That's every couple. You know, um, just be a bit of aware of the situation that your partner is in. Listen a bit more. But don't also give yourself up, you know, also make make sure that your partner knows what you want and how you feel. And sometimes there's nothing to say because you you feel OK, you know, and there's, there's maybe not uh, you don't have to, you know, invent problems just to talk about them. Um, but that's just important, I think, in every relationship. He's such a wise man. <laughs> yeah, it's the age. <laughs> no, but you said something really important here, and I've heard it from many conversations. Um, you know, there's two sides to this. Number one is, come on, you should be happy. You're so lucky to live this life. How can you think that you know that you've lost something? And at that, and I'm glad that you highlighted that because. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's the reality. Some partners yeah. think that way. And you've seen it around in our networks. We've seen it, uh, you know, like you should just be happy to have this lifestyle and be happy to stay at home because other women, because it's the speech usually of men who would say, yeah. you know, other women would dream for what you have. Yeah. Um, but then there is the other side sometimes that happens, is the guilt as a partner, you are considerate and you don't think that it's a, It's a given that somebody gives Mm. up their career for you. And then instead of being the support of you, then we could easily end up in a vicious circle of, of, of guilt, of mutual guilt for each other. And that's not healthy either. Yeah. So I love that you brought that up. I think that's one of the big highlights here that I would really insist on. And what you said is like, you know, when people say, oh, you should be happy. You live in a nice house in, (laughs) I don't know. Bangkok or you live in a nice apartment in New York, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, be aware that not many people have maybe that privilege uh, and, 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 and that opportunity. But having a house or being in a house or being in an apartment does not make it necessarily a home. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to make wherever you are also your home. And, um, and people feel, you know, need different things to feel at home. And it's not just, you know, a size of an apartment. It's not just the location of an apartment. It's not just certain services. It's feeling at home. You know, it's feeling at ease with your partner. It's having your friends around. It's having your support systems. It's having your job as well, you know, or whatever your tasks that you need to do. 
So that all is part of home, not just the monetary and physical locations of places where people, if they come and visit you and stay maybe for two hours with two glasses of champagne in their hand, you know, and think like, oh, what a nice lifestyle. Um, again, we're not complaining and we have a positive outlook and we are happy about the lives we lead. But, you know, that's things sometimes are on the surface and, and people are much more deeper and need more things than just, you know, these physical maybe environments. You know, there's the professional side of you. You've been working in HR and then there's a personal side of you of being the working partner, the one who is being sent abroad um, and being followed. I kind of would like to see what are your two cents, your tip, like top advice to, first of all, the partner, how would you, what would you tell in few words to the working partners of how they should approach, you know, this journey to be able to make it the best, the best of it for themselves, uh, but also for their partners. Um, and, as a dual career couple? I think there's two aspects. There's the, there's the, there's the partner aspect and there's the organizational aspect. Um, as I said before, I think the organizations have to be aware what they're asking from partners if they send them with their employees from place to place. So there should be things in place, be it a family liaison officer, you know, or be it somebody who helps with finding jobs um, or with a network. And I'm not just talking about maybe where the best kindergarten is or where the best Austrian schnitzel is in, in New York, but really like also a support system, you know, like job-wise, um, educational, uh, and, and use their resources for training and, and making that transition easier and also the integration into the job situation easier uh, where where you're going next um and from the partner side i think coming back to myself for a long time my first four postings actually south africa uae us and iran i just decided by myself you know i i just knew what i want what i don't want i was just saying i want to go there I want to explore this. Um, I'm, 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 I know I'm going to be happy there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is not, you know, your organization might offer you a position. You might want to have a position. It's not a, your decision anymore. It's a decision of the whole team mm -hmm. or the whole tandem. So, as a partner, I would really bring my voice on the table or to the table. Uh, and and as we do, you know, when we want to when we think about where we're going to go next and, you know, how's our life going to look like in the next 10 years, it's not only about the organization making the decision or the, the person that moves professionally uh, or is the first one, let's say, to move professionally. Um, it needs to be discussed. And it's not only about the job. It's about the conditions there. It's about the job opportunities. It's about the lifestyle. It's about the language. Um, it's, it's, and, and as a, you know, sometimes you might not get the position you want, uh, in, in my case, for instance, because it might not be the position that your partner can really handle very well. And that's just important. Um, so I think this is from both sides, HR side, organizations have to be aware of what they're asking partners to do, and they have to support them, not necessarily always financially, but also with opportunities and with networks and with with support and, and, and training. And on the other hand, you know, you have to speak out in the partnership and make clear what do you want, what does the other one want, and find a common denominator and find the best option for both and not just for one. Mm. This is such a good point. And, and especially when you said, you know, it doesn't have to be financial. It has to be about culture. Like in terms of culture, mentality, we need to understand that this is a team deal. And organizations have been growing globally and for for decades thanks to the support actually of the whole family absolutely. absolutely so the role cannot be undertaken and we should not take it for granted for sure but i think we're in a time where we need to understand as well that it's not about financial support it's mm. especially nowadays that budgets are being cut and everything it's about intention as well this is so good yeah so how about now you've met a lot of expat partners in different situations in different contexts and everybody's different but what is the that you want to share with them 
to support them in this journey and make the best uh, decision in their journey? First of all, um, sign up to tandemnomads.com. <laughs> wow, that's um, great. No, seriously. I mean, honestly, um, and I'm not. I'm not doing this, and you didn't tell me to do this. No. Uh, but but as an expat partner or spouse, it there's a wealth of information and good practices and 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 uh, lessons learned um, that you can benefit from. So I think sometimes you don't have to reinvent the wheel and just listen to people who've done it before. Talk to people who've done it before get more information. So yes, Tandem Nomads or whatever, maybe other platform there is, This it, 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 you're not alone. Let's put it that way. Wow. You're not alone out there. It's not, you, you're not the only one having that problem. So listen, talk to people, be aware of what's happening uh, and learn from other people's mistakes or maybe best practices. Secondly, speak up, you know, just speak up. Don't just listen, but speak up and, and make your voice heard either through your partner in the organization of your partner or towards your partner or towards other people. You know, if, if, if nobody knows what you want and what you are striving for and how you feel, nobody can help you. And, and people might think like, oh, it's all okay. You know, I mean, she's been or he's been going with me now for 20 years and he loves it, you know, and then maybe not, you know, mm. so, so, so speak up. Um, and also be aware, maybe thirdly of, of, of the limitations, you know, not everybody can get a hundred percent of what they want all the time. Mm. So you have to sometimes be, you have to make a compromise you have to look maybe really sometimes in monetary terms at the balance sheet, what comes out at the end, who's earning more money, what is money important, is location important. So um, be ready to compromise and, and find a common solution, uh, even if it's not 100% uh, um, agreeable to you or, or makes you 100% happy. But if it only makes you 80% happy, that's not so bad, you know, and, and you can't always be over the top and happy all the time. So, yeah, that's my advice. If I need to retire, I think you're ready to take over the show. <laughs> because of our age difference, I have the feeling I might retire earlier, um, but I would love to, in my retirement, support you in your show and, and, and carry your bags from place to place. <laughs> Wow. Nomad Nation, I really hope that you find a lot of value in what Michael did share. Honestly, I did not make him prepare and I'm listening and like, this is amazing advice. So thank you for sharing that. I wish somebody had told me that when I started those three key tips that you shared. And the big one for me is the one you said, speak up. I cannot agree with you more. Speak up for what you want. And that's the biggest mistake that I've seen a lot of unhappy expat partners, men or women, by the way, uh, struggle with is because you expect, we often expect other people to guess what's wrong and what's not working. You cannot fix it if you don't speak up. And, and, and first of all, speak up, I think doesn't mean fighting, doesn't mean, um, it just means saying, okay, I'm struggling with this. And, and then, and sometimes, first of all, it's just about listening, like we said before, and then figuring out a solution together. It's not about accusing the other person, but at some point, sometimes we need to fight. And I think you've been also fighting for, for many things along the journey to speak up for our rights and speak up for what we want in, in our journey and to make the best of it somehow. So, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, any word to end before we say goodbye? Um, no, I just want to say, you know, um, after all this, I love to be uh, a tandem nomad with you uh, and, and, and I love to be on this journey with you. So uh, professionally, privately, um, in love and, and, and it's, I'm happy. <laughs> That's my last word, so my last sentence. I'm happy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, honey. You mean the world to me and uh, Nomad Nation, I can tell you, I believe in the importance of support system. Uh, and we're not all fortunate to be able to have that support system. But um, I have to say that I feel very lucky to have your support. Without you, nothing of this would have happened. So thank you so much for everything, everything you've done to support me on this journey. Thank you. I think it's the other way around too. 
Thank you. Thank you. Namat Nation, I hope that you found great inspiration. As we said, we all have our individual stories. We're all different couples, but hopefully a little bit of a peek behind our scenes uh, would help you in your journey. That's what we hope, uh, at least through this. So thank you so much for listening, Nomad Nation, and I look forward to meeting you in the next episode. Stay tuned to turn all your challenges into wonderful opportunities. <laughs>